where you ought to be, Ken. I'm going to be right here. You want the big deal? No, just right there is fine. It's just perfect. Okay. Everything is good. I'm wired. I think. Wired, huh? Yeah, I'm wired. <laughs> Now you're all scattered out there like paper, uh, pepper on paper. Can't you get closer together or did you forget to take a bath? <laughs> Some of you forgot to take a bath. <laughs> oh, okay. Bring them down. <laughs> Bring them down. Does this thing buzz on you once in a while? Who's in charge? Does that buzz on you once in a while, brother? Okay. If you can't see the screen, it's your problem, not mine. <laughs> Good evening. Well, that was a little weak. <clears throat> Good evening. That's better. Thank you. Thank you. How many know my first name? Oh, let me do it the other way. How many do not know my first name? Okay, we got Fred, you know better than that. <laughs> I'm Ken Robb. My wife and I have been here since, I guess, uh, January of this year. And we have enjoyed our time and continue to enjoy the time as God gives us time along. Grateful that you're here tonight. And I've asked Kenny. Kimball to lead us in an opening prayer. And somewhere we've got a microphone. Maybe this one could be charged. Uh... Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for another day that you have given us. We thank you for all the little blessings that you give us, such as our health and things that we don't think about on a daily basis. We pray for those that are ill. We pray for those that um, are suffering from the strife in the world. We pray that you be with them. We pray that you be with the world leaders and guide their decisions. We thank you that we all made it here safely today. We pray that we sit here and listen with an open mind so that we can learn something and walk better in the path closer to you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Kenny. If you don't know this young man, you need to. Anyone here doesn't know Kenny Kimball? Not a soul says so, Kenny. I guess you're okay. <laughs> you forgot where you were sitting. Okay. <laughs> I love the Word of God. I really do. And I have a lot to tell about that at another time, but not tonight. But one of the things I'd like for us to think about is what you've been thinking about this past week, or I should say the last several days, and they are very important to us. And Vacation Bible School is a good time for adults. Uh, you've, just studied, you've studied about uh, manna, quail, and uh, what's that other one? Water. And uh, thanks for uh, Bill Sykes for leading the class on Sunday evening for that. And then, of course, uh, the other evening, uh, we talked about the Ten Commandments. We really, really talked about the setting for the Ten Commandments. And I appreciate Tyler Bush for leading us uh, into the second one of those Ten Commandments. And then last evening we had a, a very fine discussion and illustration about the tabernacle and how it relates uh, to the church and some of the things that relate to our relationship with God. And I appreciate the work that the gentleman did with that. But tonight, this is what we want to talk about. And I think about Canaan's land as being quite a journey for the children of Israel when they left Egypt. I can't imagine what it had been like with 600,000 Jews and the rest multiple, multiple uh, million, two million people perhaps that had left uh, the land of Egypt. It had to be a very interesting challenge. But one of the things that's really interesting to me is the long, strong arm of God that led these children along. And in Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 21, you have these thoughts from the New King James Version. You have brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong arm and an outstretched arm. 
and this outstretched arm has a relationship to the word Yahweh. And we want to talk a little bit about Yahweh perhaps as we go along. There are at least 14 different specific relationships talking about God's long, strong arm leading the children of Israel along. And another place, perhaps almost 50 different allusions to God's strong arm. But the concept is really a beautiful one in terms of God's provisions and promises that he calls for us. He calls us to have a covenant relationship with him. Redemption in Christ Jesus, of which we all know about. The blessed hope of heaven, of course. And faith that works in action. Faith that will work, and that's the promises that God gives to us if we're willing to work. If we're willing to work. And the fruition that God wants us to have is that the faith will be at work in us. But what about Joshua? Joshua is a very interesting man. He's the son of Hun, successor to Moses, and the author of the book that bears his name. How many of you know what Joshua's name really means? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, what does Joshua mean? Speak out. Well, a little bit more than that. A little bit more than that. Yahweh is salvation. That's what Joshua means. Yahweh is salvation. Now, I'd like for you to turn, if you will, please, to uh, Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. We're wanting to be reading. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version. And throughout this text, you're going to read the word Lord. And in the Hebrew text, this is Yahshua. That's the Hebrew word for Lord. I didn't say Yehovah. It's Yahshua. And in Yahweh is perhaps a very unique way of saying that. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Hun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great, great sea toward the setting of the sun, this will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. What a promise in this section. But we continue in verse 5, the latter part of verse 5. Scripture says, And just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall give the people this possession of the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful and do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will have your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The call and the commission of Joshua is a very beautiful thing. It talks about a promise, taking hold of the land that is going to be given. And it's a very important concept to think about as we go along. And in this call, God gave Joshua full assurance. And he says, no man, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not forsake you, nor will I fail you. What a promise, a great promise that God has given. Joshua's commissioning service is gonna be found as we've already read in verses five through nine. But in this section, there are four things that we need to look at. And the first one is that to be strong and to be courageous. How many of us can be strong and courageous? That's what God is calling for. It's a command. It's a command. 
And so in the first place, it says, be strong and of good courage to divide the land, as we see in verse six. And then he will say in the second part, be strong and very courageous to do the law, to do the law. And then the third is the command and the promise that we've already seen in verse eight. And it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. And then in the fourth place, God repeats this assurance to Joshua again in verse nine, as which we have seen and look again. Have I not commanded you, be strong, be courageous, do not tremble, do you not dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And the important thing to remember is this emphasis that we've already seen in verse eight. We'll go back and take a look at it, or you will in your book. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, shall not depart from your life. You'll meditate it upon it both day and night. You'll be careful to do everything that is written in it. Everything that is there, it will make your way prosperous and you will have success. And that's the kind of success I believe that God wants us to have as we go along. God would not put it there unless that's what he really wanted for us. And so we come to understand that God is a covenant keeper. Now, what covenant promise do you see on the screen? I don't know where the microphone is, but can somebody tell me what that story is about very quickly? Can someone tell me? Raise your hand, otherwise I won't tell you. <laughs> no one knows? Not a soul knows what that? Would not destroy the world with a flood again. Say it again. God, would, God made a covenant that he would never destroy the earth by water. And who received that promise? Noah. Noah, but who else received that promise? Everybody. We did. We have received that promise. We, you know, I think we're a very proud people. We really are a very proud people. And sometimes it's hard for us to be submissive, to fall into the rule of others. We don't want to understand or try not to understand the rationale that God has behind his commands, but we are to obey them anyway. When God commands us to do something, sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense, but it tests our faith. It tests our faith. And we have the opportunity to prove that we do understand that really Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's our test of faith. And so this story of Joshua is a very inspiring one. It talks about what happens to people when they're willing to obey God's will, even when commands just don't make sense. They just sometimes don't make sense. But now I'd like for someone to tell me who these men are. Can anyone tell me who these men are? Surely we've got some good Bible students in here who know who these men are. Not a soul back there, uh, Brother Paul, not a soul. What? Oh, we're gonna, all right. I'll take a guess, is it the 10? He's going to take spies. a guess. <laughs> well, if I added Joshua and Caleb to the list, would you know who they are? Come on. Do you know who they are now, Eric? Whoops, somebody said it over here. Yes, the spies that went into Canaan. Can you pronounce their names? Oh, that's not fair, is it? <laughs> that's not fair. But if we add Joshua and Caleb to the list, we certainly know who these men are. And it's difficult for me, I don't know about you, but it's difficult for me to separate Joshua and Caleb when we talk about uh, this particular study before us. But there is another thing that I'd like for us to think about. And it's this passage in Joshua chapter 14, verses seven through nine. This will be the New American Standard Version. And they, Joshua and Caleb, spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel saying, the land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land, yeah, we've got the right one, and a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land for they shall be our prey. 
Their protection has been removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Notice in red, scribed again, their protection has been taken away from them and the Lord is with us. That is a great theme for all of us. Do we not know that the Lord is with us? He really is. And there is a major problem, I think, in these spies as they return back from their quest and something I think we probably need to think about, and this is a question for all of us. How do we keep our focus on God and not on the obstacles in our life? Did anyone care to answer that question? How do we keep our focus on God and not on the obstacles in our life? How do we keep the focus on God and not the obstacles in our life? I'm not gonna answer that question. Maybe through the course of our study, we'll discover that. I think sometimes fear is a paralyzing thing in our life. Things we're afraid of, they paralyze us. And we need to deal with that. Even the stoutest of individuals, even the strongest of an individual, fear will sometimes cripple them. And when we perceive a threat, when we perceive a threat in our personal well-being, when obstacles stand in our way, stand between us and our goals, we sometimes feel that something terrible is gonna happen. And we feel threatened. Maybe our particular station in life is gonna be seriously held in jeopardy. And in those times, when those things happen to us, we need to remember the promises of God. And so when these spies went out into this promised land that God was gonna give them, they went on a reconnaissance mission to access or to see about the land of Canaan. They had no idea what they were going to encounter. It was a great honor. It really was a great honor for these men to be chosen by God, to accept the assignment. Twelve men, top men, each one man from each tribe. In their training and their leadership, they did not know. I don't think they really know what was really going to happen. Something really overwhelming was going to happen to them. Who would ever thought, and I think this was mentioned a couple of nights ago, who would ever thought that they would come back with a cluster of grapes hanging on a pole where two men having to carry them? Who would ever thought that that would happen? Who would ever thought that the Canaanites of the land were so big and so tall and so massive that they, uh, the children of Israel were just dwarfed? The Israelite army was just actually dwarfed. And no wonder these spies came back with a whirling mix of misunderstanding about things, emotions in their head, coming back to the commander in chief, Moses, to give a full report. And I, maybe you can understand what's happening here. Can you imagine the scene? They sent them out. Now they're coming back. So Moses and Aaron gather, gather the people together to hear the news and the spies come back and they confirm. They confirm absolutely that the land really is all that God said it was. But one thing was wrong. One thing was wrong. They focused on what they saw, and that was the obstacles of the land. And they shouldn't have done that. They focused on the, the giants of the land. They should not have done that. Oh, they gave a very accurate report. There's no question of that. But they failed to tell the whole story. And Moses, rather Joshua and Caleb, give that whole story to Moses and to the rest of the people. These faithful men, what they had seen, now they begin to reiterate in talking about the promises that are actually given. Notice, if the Lord delights in us, Numbers 14, verses eight through nine, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Now Joshua and Caleb are the only two that saw the promised land. And we'll talk about Moses seeing it in a little while. But they're the only two because they focused on what the goal of that God had laid out for them and not the obstacles that laid out there in front of them. And they were really there. And sometimes when we think about the blessings that are in our life, God has greater blessings for us if we just live by faith and trust Him. And that's what I think we can learn from these uh, two men especially. We are to never, never, never allow short-sighted vision to be our guide. Never to allow that to happen. 
We are to focus not on the obstacles, but to focus on the far-reaching plans that God has for our life. And that's something I think we always need to remember because obedience, get this, obedience always brings a blessing. And we see this as Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, where he said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Another translation will use the word keep it. But in the Greek, this word observe really means to watch, to be on guard, to keep it, to observe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And so a promise is given, blessings are received, and this passage of scripture really ought to be a memory verse for all of us in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. I suppose that Tyler Bush has had this memorized several times over the course of his course of study, but I don't know that for sure. Am I right, Tyler? Uh huh. Oh, well, he says, oh, uh-huh, maybe so. <laughs> I think he does. But this is what is recorded, and you can read it. And if it's desirable in your sight, desirable rather, in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. No, he didn't say we. He said, I will serve the Lord. Well, that ends a little bit of what we want to say about Joshua, but we'll come back to him as we look at Caleb. Caleb is a very interesting man. Some people have said that Barnabas is the Caleb of the New Testament, while Caleb is the Barnabas of the Old Testament. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Some have said that Barnabas was Caleb of the New Testament, while Caleb was Barnabas of the Old Testament. Not much said is really in scripture. We don't have a lot of scripture talking about Caleb, and yet there's enough said about him that we can find him as a very inspiring example for our life today. He stands as a man of dignity, unbending in devotion and principle of faith, of courage and conviction. We do well, and I think as your Vacation Bible School programs perhaps have done, we do well to study Bible men and women for that matter who have performed nobly for the cause of Christ and for the cause of God. And those kind of lessons really point us to how we are to serve God to our best advantage, or rather serving God to his best advantage because he's using us as his servants. And so we need to look at Caleb's life. And first off, what is the character? What is the type of character that Caleb has? Well, Barnabas in the, Old, in the New Testament, Acts chapter four, verse 46, is called a son of encouragement. Caleb, on the other hand, has been called a man of heart, or all heart. And in his life story, we come to a great deal to know about him. Certain manifestations of his life tell us about his heart, but what a great heart he really has. In fact, you will search in vain. I challenge you to think about this. You will search in vain in the life story of Caleb to find any one single incident in his life where he was pessimistic, cheerless or dejected. Just won't find it. It's just not there. But rather you really find what's opposite. He shines in a beautiful way for us. And he really shines in such a way as even Paul many years later will say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Where's that found? Well, we don't have it up there. Where's it found? Philippians 4 and verse 4. In another place, he will say, rejoice forevermore in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. But Caleb was this kind of a man. His spirit was most graciously given in his action-packed life to show us how we can live and how we can stand courageously before God. And that really is a very important thing for us. And I think probably the most valuable lesson that we can have is a reflection of one of many is uh, Psalm chapter 81 and verse 1. And you can see it up there. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of our Lord is our strength. And if we're outside of Christ and if God is not, you don't have that kind of joy, you don't have the kind of strength that God wants you to have. Because God tells us right here in Psalm 81.1 that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And yet I do believe, and you know this to be true, 
that there are a lot of dejected, moping, cheerless Christian people. You know some? You know some? I do. And it, you know, their sorrow forever. That's their life. They're just sorrow forever. Their face just says, you know, there's nothing good about life whatsoever, whatever. Nothing's good. And those kind of people do not make a very good impression on an unbelieving world. Those kind of Christians do not do that. But Caleb was a man of all heart, cheerful, sunshiny in every way. And he gives us the kind of understanding that I think we need to have in terms of being happy and joyful in our own Christian walk. Because when we look at this man, we find some really great things. And now you recall that when the spies came back, they came back giving Moses quite a report. And Caleb and Joshua give a rather gracious report. And they did not minimize the difficulties whatsoever. No, they didn't shortchange the issue at all. They said, there are difficulties. The men are mighty, the cities are walled, their surroundings are such that, well, we have to give our earnest attention. And we're all able, no, we are well able to overcome those difficulties. Now that wording is not found in your Bible particularly, but it's found in my Hebrew Bible. This is my Hebrew translation of that text. There are difficulties. The men are mighty. The cities are walled. The surroundings, areas, we have to give earnest attention to that. But we were well able to overcome the difficulties. And that was their report. We were well able to do that. What about the other ten? I don't know that I want them in my camp. Do you want them in yours? <laughs> I don't think you do. I don't. And so we need to remember, they gave a quite a different report. All 12 certainly agreed that the land was beautiful. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. The grapes were huge, large, had to be carried on a pole. It was a land so inviting, so glorious, according to uh, Roman, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 13, verses 23 and 24. It was a beautiful place. But 10 of them were so absolutely overwhelmed, pessimism ruled, unbelief ruled. And they gave their pessimistic report. The people broke down and whining and wailing and, and dismay just seemed to seize the people of, of Israel. And that word seize is a, well, it's a crippling kind of word in the Hebrew. It crippled them so they couldn't work. Crippled them to the point that they couldn't serve. But Caleb stood up, this great man of faith, he calmed the crowd. He spoke to them, at least for a season, in their dejection and their doom. And there's a lesson I think we need to learn in all of that. Here was a man, Caleb, who could trans uh, tranquilize, get that word out of my mouth. Here was a man who could tranquilize others. You know what tranquilizers do? Well, he was the kind of man that could do that. He lived in a world of, that didn't value things as he thought they should be valued. The men that he was talking to were troubled, they were faithless, and he came along and tried to take that away from them. And you know people like this, perhaps, who can bend the ears of other people and just cause them to think about other things rather than good things. And perhaps a dozen sentences will come out of their mouth. They will tag somebody's ears and sooner or later, perhaps sooner, they get angry with each other and they become like untamed beasts at each other. But Caleb was a kind of man that could tranquilize. He could calm others. He could quell the crowd, the mob. And we need that kind of man today. They needed him then. They had him. And he was the kind of man that would stand in their midst, a priceless gift that he had, priceless value. And that's the kind of man, that's the kind of man, not only tranquilizing others, but he's the kind of man that is needed in the church today, who can quell callous and difficult dividing moments and reach common ground. That's the kind of great price we have in Caleb and the kind of great price we need in a man who's willing to lead in the body of Christ today. Now, Caleb was gracious in his power willing to still the crowd and know it was tumultuous, difficult circumstances surrounded him. And yet this great man of great heartedness was a man that had his whole life filled with the idea that I'm going to encourage other people. I'm going to try to help other people. And his genius was wonderful. 
And that's the kind of man I think the world today is looking for. The man that can put heart, can put heart back into people that don't have heart. And I think our world suffers and pants and languishes, if you will, for such a leader. Not only in the church today, but in our world, I think. And Caleb was that kind of man who could put heart back into men. What a genius he had. What a wonderful thing. And sometimes I think we get in a crowd of people and, and the negative issues rise in 10 minutes. The negative is so bad you think you've been to a funeral or something worse. And that sometimes happens. And they can take the heart right out of you, but not Caleb. Caleb was a man that could bring encouragement and help. He had the kind of spirit, I think it was a conquering spirit, a spirit that we all need to have. And I know, and you know, that there are reverses in life, there really are. There are times when our crops will fail, or at least go bad, business might be dismal, collections for the business may be slow coming in, our health may not be like what we'd like for it to be, not desirable at all, but Caleb is a kind of man that could spirit back in the heart of people and say, it's okay. He can speak the word and calm people and help people. And we need that kind of person today in the church and in society, we know that. Caleb was that kind of man. But he also had a courageous heart for God. The 10 gave their report and spelled a very gloomy story. Giants in the land, they were so large they felt like grasshoppers. We can't possibly contend with them. And as they talked, the worse it got. And the heart of the people were ready to faint away. What would happen if we had that kind of spirit in the church today? People would just faint away because there was a gloomy report. But then Joshua stands up in the midst of them, and this is what he says. Much that these 10 men have to say is true or so. There are great men in the land we have visited, and their cities are large and mightily fortified, but we are well able to overcome them. Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. Not only able, but they were well able to overcome them according to Numbers chapter 13, verses 28 and 30, and also chapter 14 and verse nine. Here was a man who had loftiness in his spirit, a picture of courage. There are reverses, there are surprises, there are disappointments that come along in our life. We don't know, we do know that. But Caleb was the kind of man that could bring about fortification in our life to bring courage again, to strike it up again. And I think our world, and you know this, I think that our world is whining and crying and pessimistic and discouraged. Along comes Caleb, and he cultivates a different kind of spirit to meet the battle of life. But there's something else we need to see about Caleb's character. It's his conviction and his fidelity to duty. Caleb was a man who dared to be in the minority. I love this part of the story. He was a kind of man that could not turn pale when things got bad, when the crowd went against him. He did not become a weak need servant of God. His anchorage was such that he knew exactly where he stood. His absolute obedience was to God and he knew where he stood. He knew what was right and he went forward with that. He dared therefore to be in the minority when minority was not a popular thing to be. And he knew that. He dared, therefore, to stand against the crowd. And that's not always comfortable. But he had the kind of force that would be that kind of character for him. And on the other hand, on the other hand, sadly so, people will make sacrifices against the truth. They will change their principles. They will make right different than right because they don't want to be a part of the minority even though the minority may be right. They don't want that. And perhaps we need to say, along with that idea, we will have no lot or fellowship with that kind of evil or with that kind of manner of life. I remember in my Russian language training and living in Russia for a while, nearly five years, they have a special little term called straight about. And that's what Caleb is talking to us about. We need to turn around, 
straight about, live honestly with good terms, with good conscience, squarely looking the, with an eagle eye and face the things that are wrong. Be courageous and push those other things aside to get rid of them. And Caleb was that kind of man. He stood out against the majority. He stood against them. And the revelation of truth lived in his life. But oftentimes, oftentimes the majority, well, they can be utterly wrong. Have you seen that? Sometimes the majority can be utterly wrong. The voice of the people of God sometimes is not right. Oftentimes the minority is right. And we need to think about that. Where does our allegiance stand? What is there, where do we stand in terms of truth and principle? Are we wishy-washy? I heard somebody say that last night. <laughs> Are we wishy-washy? Or was it the night before? I've forgotten. Was that you, Tyler, that said that? Wishy-washy? I don't remember. We must not be that kind of people. Caleb was not that kind of person. His character was priceless. It was powerful. His fidelity to duty was against the majority. The majority said, we can't do that, and Caleb said, we can. But there's something else about Caleb that's important. He was parentally young, forever young, I guess we could say. And that's one of the beautiful things about his story that I like. He was a man that did not grow old. Oh, he was 85 years of old age, as we'll talk about in a moment. But he did not grow old. In his advanced years of 85 years, he said this, I am as ready to go to war as I was 45 years ago. I am just as strong for it, and I'm ready for it. I am eager for the battle as I was before. I was eager for it now, the Hebrew text will say. I am as ready for it now as I was before. And then we need to notice verse 9 of that text of Joshua 14. So Moses swore that day, saying, Surely the land on which our, your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance to you and your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God fully. Something we need to think about. Because you have followed the Lord my God fully. And out of this comes a beautiful story about Caleb and a delightful thought. Here was a man who lived his life to the last breath of his life. Just like Moses. He lived his life to the last breath of his life. Young in spirit, may have been old in age, but not in body. He was enthusiastic for the world and for the work that God had given him. And to me, this is a very beautiful uh, picture of Caleb's remarkable character. Advanced years of 85 years. And now he asked Joshua for the hardest job of his life. The hardest job of his life. And this is what he says. I am still as young today as I was the day of Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now. Now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakin are there, or were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord has spoken. As the Lord has spoken. Joshua gave him a permission to go on that difficult mission. How many old men do you know that say something like this? Leave me alone. I've done my part, let somebody else do it. Not Caleb, not at 85 years, not Caleb. And no man or woman for that matter should ever talk like that in this brief life that we have to live. We should never talk like that. A man's face must be set like flint, doing the duty to the very last breath that we have in our body. And I really want to tell you this from the very sincere part of the very depth of my own heart. The very day or hour that I cannot continue to do God's work, then I want to go home and be with Father. Someone has said, I'd like to die with my boots on. Have you heard that before? That's me. That's Ken Robb. That's me. 
And there is not any other place, there's not any other need that for any man or woman, for that matter, to get old in this world. If we link ourselves to the right things with the right point of view in life like, Kyle, like Caleb did, he was perennially young, advanced years of 85, and he was given the hardest job of his life. He's going to go take Hebron in the hill country. And that he did. In Joshua chapter 14 and verse 11, the scripture says in part, put on my shoulders the hardest thing that I have ever had to do, and I will go forth to the battle. That's my Hebrew translation. And forth going he did go, and he won to the everlasting credit of his name. What a powerful name, Caleb. I don't know if many people have named their children Caleb, do you? But it's a worthy name. It really is. Wholehearted he was, devoted to God. And that kind of spirit, brethren, will consume the evil that's in our world. Don't we know that? It really will. And he was that kind of man. He was not ashamed to seek the will of God first and foremost. Even when the majority said, we can't do it. But he followed God wholeheartedly. And you can see that in those scriptures. It says it over and over again. His secret, it's a secret, sublime secret perhaps, but it's right there in front of us. Caleb wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And whenever a man or woman does that, what, does we, what do we care about the clamor and the bellowing of, of the multitude of people who say you can't do it, can't be done? Whenever a man does the right thing, he does not care what the majority says if the majority is wrong. And whenever a man does, he cares for only one thing, and that's the job well done that God will say to him as he serves him. Caleb was a man who followed God. And Caleb said that for himself, I have wholly followed him. And Moses said that of Caleb as well. But God said it better. My servant Caleb has wholeheartedly, that's what the text in Hebrew says, has wholeheartedly followed me. What a picture. But what about Moses? What about Moses? I think I have just 15 minutes or less, 12 minutes or less. A great Hebrew leader he was. Legislator, born in Egypt. His destruction was to come because Pharaoh the king said all the babies are gonna die, male babies are gonna die. And it's a beautiful story. It thrills our heart when we study about Moses in that early life. Pharaoh's daughter comes and sees that child in, the, in that wicker basket floating on the water, picks that child up, calls, her, calls him his own. That story really thrills our heart and always has. I suppose volumes of, could be written and stated about the great virtues and difficulties that, that Moses had. But the greatest honor and privilege that Moses had was known in Exodus 33:11. what holy intimacy Moses must have had with God, being guided and aided in his labors and life. No wonder he was a mighty leader that we like so much. He is our hero. He lived to be 120 years, and his life can be divided into four, or rather three, 40-year periods. As Pharaoh's son, he learned to be somebody. In the desert, Forty years later, he became as a man of nobody. But as a leader of God's hosts, he learned that God was everybody and everything. As a man came face to face with God, so was Moses. A remarkable man indeed. So many things that could be said about him, we hardly have time to talk about them all. But one thing I like in particular is this one. The refusal and choice that we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, I think needs to be noted very carefully in our life, embedded in our life if you don't mind, carefully noted, and it is this. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be ill-treated with the people of God and then to en rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin. 
not just enough to refuse. We must choose. We must choose. There are other moments in his life, being a lawgiver presents many different kinds of things to us. I find them very exciting. I found 13 different similarities between Moses and Jesus. I don't have time to talk about all 13, but I'll give you just two. And you tell me where they're found. Both were preserved from the perils of infancy. Both were preserved from the perils of infancy. I can see every hand raising. I know the answer to that. <laughs> and another one, both had the power over the sea, to control the sea. Both had that same power. And yet Jesus will have to say to us in John chapter four, or John chapter five and verse 46, and Moses, he said, wrote of me. And in that he says, Moses has set his apostolic authority or authorship in those books. And he says, for if you have believed Moses, Jesus says this, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me for he wrote of me. Even Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15 has a similar declaration. But I really like Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. Luke 24 and verse 44. Jesus says, these are my words which I have spoke to you while I was still with you, that the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And they were. I know that you had this study Sunday night, right, Bill? You also had this one Sunday night. But at Cadiz Barnea was a really different story, a really terrible story. And the people contended with Moses, we're perishing, we have no water. But God said to Moses to take his staff and speak to the rock. No, instead he struck the rock. Struck it twice, in fact. And God said in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12, because you did not believe me, you treated me as not holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This one sin prevented him from going into the land of Canaan. All that wandering around in the wilderness, all that murmuring and complaining and griping, Moses had it up to here. Isn't that right, Bill? Is that the right way to say that? He had it up to here. He was angry, the children of Israel. Instead of speaking to the rock, what did he do? He struck it twice. And God says, because you did not consider me holy before the people, you will not enter in. He disobeyed God's command. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13 tells that story. Well, the departure of Moses is interesting. He's a man who I think who lived by faith. Even though he had to turn his back and walk with the people who had so little faith for those 40 or really 38 years. But the triumph of his life, that from the top of Mount Nebo, towering pinnacle of Pisgah, he lifted up his eyes to see the good land of promise. And then he gave way to Joshua to lead the people into the promised land. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 34. And there Moses died. Verses five and six of that chapter, no one knows his burial place, not until this day. But he was 120 years old, according to verse seven. He lived 120 years. And yet at that particular stage in his life, his life eyes, his life eyes were not dim, nor his body without energy and without strength. His force, his natural force was not abated. He climbed that mountain and God laid him to rest in that place. God buried him. And I'm gonna give a little tongue in cheek thought here, a little poetic license if you don't mind, because this is the only man in the Bible that I know that had an undertaker. The only man in the Bible, God buried him. Here was a man who really lived by faith unto death. And so I think God's invitation begins right here. 
How do we stand with Joshua and Caleb and Moses? Do we stand with a wholehearted devotion for God? All the thousands of ills that we have, and we have them, some numbered, some not numbered, some shared, some unshared. But our greatest need is to have a right relationship with Almighty God. That's where we have the power. That's where we have the joy. That's where we have the hope. And yet there are some people who would just like to trifle with their possession or profession about God as being children of God. And we don't use the word trifle very much. When's the last time you heard about the word trifle? It has a very tough meaning. It's to place little or no importance on conviction or purpose. Are we guilty of that? Are we guilty of that? But some people will trifle with the Lord Jesus Christ, and when they do, they trifle with the church, they trifle with scripture, they trifle with us, the brethren, and they trifle with eternal life. That's why I think we embrace Vacation Bible School for adults. We sometimes forget and need to be reminded again of the great hope that we have and the promises that are given by God. And we have those promises, and we have these promises of these men who walked the walk, obedient faithfulness. They lived by faith and not by sight of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, so states. I want you to know that in my ministry in other places, I would pray almost every day for the brethren of the church I served. Why did I do that? because I want them to have peace. I want them to have joy. I want them to have a zest for Christ that God intended through his word that we should have. A zest that does not destroy us, but prepares us for a life well lived. And yet we know a lot of folks that don't have peace, don't have hope, no joy, no zest, no interest in the church. But the answer really is right at our side, right at our very side. And yet people have no conscientious nature within them to have a devotion for God. That they might have a blessed day. But over and over again, God stills that. If we simply will have a trusting, obedient faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And yet I grieve, and you do too. You may not say it, you may not have said it, but you do grieve, I know you do. When you see people who are living a double or half-hearted life, I grieve with that. They miss the joy, the steadfast wonder that can come to them like a walk that Joshua had, the walk that Caleb had, and the walk that Moses had. Some people are just absolutely miserable. That toothache kind of feeling You know what that's like? That toothache kind of feeling? Well, let's not live the half-hearted Christian life. Let's follow God wholeheartedly like the three men we've been talking about because their life is real and they have the real secret. They have the real secret. They really do to live the masterful life that God intends for us to have. Isn't it glorious to grow up, be called a child of God, and to grow old in Christ? I think it really is. And I want us, I know the elders of this congregation and the local preacher here wants us to finish our course, to really finish our course, and not to be finished in a sour puss, embittered, pessimistic kind of life the kind of people that just make us absolutely miserable. But by God's grace, we can finish the course. We really can. Where Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And in the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me in that day. But not only me, but also for those who love his appearing. Notice the highlight in blue. And not only to me, 
but all those who love his appearing. And I really like what Paul Harvey said long ago, the late Paul Harvey, I would rather rust out No, he didn't say it that way, did he? <laughs> he didn't say that, did he? I would rather wear out than rust out. We need to have that kind of zeal. And old age, then, will not be our enemy. We're told to come home, be a friend with God forever. And the words of Jesus are reflective. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Another translation, into the joy of your Lord. And so I ask once more, is the God of Joshua and Caleb your God? Your God. Is he? Is he really? Well, that's not the end of the story. But that's all the story I have today. The ball has been in my court for about 50 minutes. Guess where the ball is going now? You ready, Tyler? It's in your court. What will you do with Jesus? I've asked my good brother Forrest Bomer to lead us in a closing prayer. Do you need the mic, brother? It's somewhere. There it is. Our God and our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your righteous and holy name. We come before you, Father, at this time through your precious Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, acknowledging you as our God, our Creator, our Maker, our Defender, our Friend, our Sustainer, acknowledging that all that we are, all that we hope to be, is because of your love and your help and your assistance that we have so bountifully received from your hand down through the years. Father, as we stand at this time in prayer before you, before your throne, <clears throat> we realize your awesomeness and at the same time, we realize our inadequacies. We realize, Father, that without you, we have no hope, not only in this world, but in the world to come. We realize, Father, that as you have said, that things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. We thank you so much, Father, for the lives of Joshua and Caleb and Moses and the many others that you have recorded for us in your word. We thank you for the example of faithfulness of strength, of joy, for the example of a life of action, the example of their trust and dependence upon you. We also realize at the same time that we are not that much different than they, in that as they lived, they also were subject to temptations. They were subject to ridicule from others. And Father, we also experience times of 
a loss of strength, a loss of heart, a loss of determination because of the temptations and the influences of this world. So it is at this time that, first of all, we ask that you would forgive us for these times of inadequacies in our life. And also, at the same time, we ask that you would help us that as we live from day to day, that we will not grow weary in well-doing, realizing that we will reap at the appointed time. Help us, Father, to have the determination in our mind to always do as you would have us to do. When we fail, we ask that you would forgive us, that you would lift us up and gently give us a push to go on and to continue to do our best. Help us, Father, that we might be blessed from you with strength so that we can carry on what you would have us to do. Help us, Father, that as we do so, that we can help to strengthen and encourage others along the way. We thank you so much, Father, for your word and for the truths and the precepts that are in it. Help us that we might each day grow to love it more and more and more. And that is, has been said that we might buy the truth and sell it not. We know that in this time, in this age, that there are many people who forsake you and forsake your word because of what they want to do. Help us to lose our pride, Father. Help us to humble ourselves before you. Help us to be the kind of servants that Joshua and Caleb and Moses and others were so that one day we can stand before you being justified through your precious son, the blood that he shed on the cross. And that we too can hear those words that would be so wonderful. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Thank you, Father, for your precious Son, the sacrifice that he made on our behalf to make all of this possible. Help us that we might grow to love one another more deeply every day. That we might grow to love you more every day. Thank you once again. Continue to be with us, Father. For it's in the name of your precious Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we ask, pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Forrest. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. I think there's some refreshment in the foyer. I use the word I think because I really don't know. <laughs>